the path of the just is like a shining light, shining brighter, bright as the noonday. Hello and welcome to Walking in the Word. Today, as we follow Paul in his travels, we're going to see him sail with Achilla and Priscilla and come to Ephesus. So, Alton, please start for us. Okay. Well, just before Paul left Corinth, he was involved in a little court battle, we might say, and it was deemed that the charges were not anything that could be done, uh, addressed in this court, so they kind of threw it out of court, and we're going to see a lot of court battles where people try to uh, harass Christians and persecute them, and they're going to start being thrown out of court. And so he set sail for Syria with Achilla and Priscilla, and um, hopefully you took my little advice and got your know, little map maybe and and you could follow Paul where he was going in all these different places. Um, so he takes Aquila and Priscilla with him, and they came to Ephesus. And it says that he went into the synagogue. Um, you have to understand something. Paul was um, tapped by God to be a apostle to the Gentiles but a lot of places you see a lot of things that were going to come to the Gentiles but it says to the Jew first and then the Gentile okay so Paul never neglected his fellow Israelites he uh, you know chapter 9 10 and 11 of Romans he speaks to that that he has a, a burden for them and that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. So he's bringing this knowledge to them. And it wasn't a, a fun thing to do because there was so much resistance. And, you know, people say, well, why was there resistance? Well, you have to understand, you, you don't spend 200 years, 400 years, you know, um, well, from the time of Moses till the time Jesus come was 4,000 years or yeah, my, my brain's addled today. Um, it was 2,000 years. Okay, so you don't live under something for 2,000 years and then just like that switch. And if you read uh, Deuteronomy 13, it will give you a kind of an idea of what they were up against because they were told to do certain things if people didn't. Uh, seemed like they were departing from the ways of God. You were to deal pretty harshly with them in a lot of cases. And so all of a sudden you have to switch gears and some of them weren't, just couldn't do it. And so Paul had to deal with that. He was the bridge to go between to kind of um, bring the, the Israelites into the New Testament. And, you know, when you read the book of Hebrews, everything it talks about, about 13 times, I think you'll find the word better. And, you know, whenever you have something and somebody wants to give you something better, well, normally you would say, why would you want to resist that? You know, if, if they, you had a ticket for coach and they said, oh, we're sorry, we overbooked it now, you're going to have to ride up in uh, first class. Would you fight with that? Would you get mad? Would you sue the company? <laughs> I don't think so. But you have to be convinced you're getting something better. And, and a lot of them just weren't. And so Paul would go into the synagogues. You'll see this a lot. When he shows up in the town, the first thing he does is go to a synagogue. Why? Because the word hadn't been brought to him yet in, in a large way and so he was going to bring it to them and give them their chance their day of visitation their day when they could look at the things and, and look at the scriptures because he reasoned with them out of the scriptures and there was only Old Testament to reason out of 
But there was, there was lots of things, Isaiah and Jeremiah and all these people are talking about the Messiah coming. And so <clears throat> you just have to uh, read them and then have somebody explain it to you, that Ethiopian eunuch, okay, he what? He came from Ethiopia and he was a eunuch or an official in Candace's um, government. But he was a Jew. A lot of people don't understand that. Where was he coming from? He was coming from Jerusalem from one of the feasts. Okay, you have to, Israelites had to show up in Jerusalem three times a year for the feasts. And he was there and now he was on his way back and he ran into Philip. And he got the gospel showed to him. He got baptized, and Philip disappeared, and he, he was just overjoyed because something happened. And so um, it says that he would reason with them, okay? And that word is dialegomai. It means to say thoroughly or to discuss in argument or exhortation. So exhortation is like cheerleading, rah, rah, rah. You can do this. This is a great thing that the Lord has done for you and you need to get in on it. And so don't resist it. Listen to what I'm saying. Look at the scriptures and go by that. Okay, too many people got their own opinions, their own ideas. You got to go back to scripture always. When uh, Josiah was cleaning out the temple, how would he know what belonged in there and what didn't after 400 years of uh, traditions of Solomon putting gods in from all his wives and uh, uh, putting a little house on the side of the temple for the Sodomites. I mean, all these things were traditions and they'd been there and they were, they believed that's what had to happen. And so... When, the, when Hilkiah found the book of the law and they read it, now they had something, a pattern to go with. This belongs in here. This don't belong in here. And, and the same thing goes with your life. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Okay, what's in there that doesn't belong? I don't know. I have a lot of traditions. We all came out of something and we have traditions. And so we have to find out if those traditions line up with the Word. So, the, so the, we have a Bible now, which, you know, people think this thing existed for, forever. The Word of God existed before the Bible existed because it wasn't written down for thousands of years. And, and then it was in scrolls and there wasn't chapters and verses till into our millennium. And so, you know, it wasn't in a book form. It wasn't in something you could carry around. Now I have it on my phone. I can carry it anywhere I want to go. And, uh, and so the, it just didn't exist that way. And so somebody like Paul, who was a Pharisee, he studied that. He was a lawyer. He studied that, those scriptures front and back. And... He studied all the scriptures. The Sadducees only studied the first five books of the Bible. They didn't consider the um, prophets or any of the Psalms or any of that as, as something they had to even pay attention to. That's why they didn't believe in resurrection. And so um, the Pharisees were a group of people that when they came back from the, from the uh, um, time they spent in Babylon, they were determined they were not going to go through that again, and they were not going to let their leaders lead them astray again. They were going to go by this law every jot and tittle. That's why they were so legalistic. They did not want to go back to Babylon. But in doing so, they lost out on the spirit of the law. And so they weren't merciful. And so when Jesus come, he was showing them something different. And they thought he was breaking the law. Well, he wasn't. He was fulfilling the law. 
and they just couldn't see that. And so it took somebody like Paul to come along, a lawyer, okay? He sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel, his name means reward of God. And you see he was a kind of a common sense person who said, let the scriptures speak and if these people are doing something wrong, it'll fall to the ground. But if it's of God, you better not be found fighting against it. So maybe back off and let things develop. And so, you know, that was a good um, idea to, uh, for, you know, think about. And Paul learned everything at the feet of Gamaliel. So anyway... Um, he would go in there and do that and, and in doing so he would gather a bunch of Greeks also around him and they would want to hear about it because now this thing was coming to them and they never even heard of the Old Testament so this was even new to them but they were stuck in in idol worship I mean Everywhere you went, there was something to, to uh, worship, some altar of some god. Of some, a lot of their gods weren't, were gods of concepts like love or, you know, what, what we would call abstract nouns. You can't put your hand on them and you can't go find a bucket of love or something. But they're concepts and they would think about them and, and try to... Um, bring them to life by carving something <laughs> or saying that's that's it. We, we don't know how to express it, but that's it. Well, it, anything like that falls short of what the reality is. And so Paul, uh, you know, when we talk about spiritual things, it's hard for some people to understand them. Well, it's, we have to can't understand spiritual things with a carnal mind. It says the carnal mind is enmity against God. And it doesn't understand the things of the Spirit, neither can it. That's why we have to be baptized in his name for remission of sins. It kills the old nature, raises up a new creation, man. The Holy Spirit comes into your life, and now you get capable a capability to understand spiritual things and some people say well that's a bunch of baloney well that's because that's where you are you're not on the spirit side of this thing you're on the carnal side carnal is the word that means meat carnivore chili con carne okay so you don't want to be a meathead that's what a, a preacher I know called us if, if we're carnally minded we're a meathead so we want to, God wants to take you out of that realm and bring you into a realm where you can understand what he's talking about. Okay, the Jews didn't come into that realm, and so they were, he said, eat my body and drink my blood. Why, they stayed away in droves after that because they weren't hearing in the spirit. And so... Um, at this point, we run into a fellow by the name of Apollos who was really a great preacher, but he only understood the, the baptismas, baptism of John, which was unto repentance. Okay, now we're past that. We are coming into the realm of Jesus Christ dying on the cross and you applying that blood to your doorpost. And how do you do it? baptism in his name and circumcision of heart which you can see in uh, um, Colossians 2 9 talks about circumcision we're buried with him in baptism and we're raised in the newness of life and so um, Apollos is somebody to, to see how he uh, operated and how he became a mighty apostle and he was got their good seal of approval from the disciples. And so now I'm going to turn it over to my lovely wife.
She's going to expound some more on that. Thank you, honey. In chapter 18, verse 25, it says that this man was instructed only, as Alan said, in the baptism of John. So we, we need to stop and look at that more thoroughly to see what does that mean, the baptism of John. Verse 26 says that he did speak boldly in the synagogue. That's where Achilla and Priscilla would have heard him. But they took him aside and they expounded the way more perfectly to him, the way of God more perfectly, verse 26 says. And then verse 27, when he decided to pass into southern Greece, the brethren wrote, the brethren wrote and exhorted the disciples to receive him. So obviously, as Alton said, he got the apostles' seal of approval because he had been further educated in the ways of God. Verse 1 of chapter 19 says, And it happened that when, when Apollos was in Corinth, that Paul went through the upper districts and came down to Ephesus and found some disciples. And Paul asks them this question. He says, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you have been believing on Jesus? Have you received the Holy Spirit? They said, We haven't even heard of this Holy Spirit. We're not sure what that means. But look at verse 3 in chapter 19. What Paul asked them was very significant. And he asked, Unto then who were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. So what we saw in chapter 18, we now see in chapter 19. Then verse 4 says this, then said Paul, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him who should come after him, that is Christ Jesus. Verse 5 of chapter 19 says, When they heard this, they were baptized, and the Amplified says baptized again this time, in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And you might say, well, what's the difference between being baptized for repentance and being baptized for uh, the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus? The difference is that remission and repentance are different. We can talk in terms of repenting. Maybe we do something wrong and then we change our mind. That literally means repent. Repent means turn from sin. It means to feel regret or sorrow and to change one's mind. And so the baptism that John taught was that of repentance, to baptize, be baptized unto repentance, to say, I'm sorry, God, for my sin. I'm sorry for my life that I've led. I have regrets. I want to change. So that, by definition, is what the word repent means. To remit, or the word remission, means to send money to a person or a place in payment of an account or a demand. I don't know about you, but every month I remit my electric bill at my house. That means I send money in payment for what I've owed of services that have been rendered. So we need to ask ourselves again, why the name of Jesus? Well, it's very simple. Who was it that was sacrificed on a cross to pay for our sins? It was Jesus. And so to be baptized into the name of Jesus means to be identified and take on the payment of our sin, the remission of our sins because of his blood and his name. Think about this. When we lay hands on someone to be healed, we lay hands on them how? In the name of Jesus. When we say a prayer, we end it with the name of Jesus. Why? Because there's a, an identification with the, the cost and the sacrifice that he paid to make available the provisions that we have. And so it's no different with baptism. We don't want to just simply be baptized for repentance, and that's what John did. We want to be baptized for remission, to signal the full payment. The payment of our sins was paid in full 
by the name of Jesus, by the sacrifice of Jesus and then identifying with him in that name. Verse 6 of chapter 19 says, And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, they received the Holy Spirit, and they spoke with tongues, and they prophesied. So the pattern was set. There's a pattern known as the pattern of first mentions. When something is mentioned for the first time in the Bible, then we take cues from that, that that principle is laid out significantly for our future understanding. So there was a receiving of the Holy Spirit with the baptism in the name of Jesus. They began to speak in tongues and they even prophesied. So the pattern has been set already. When we baptize people in the name of Jesus for the remission of sin, the scripture, the pattern has been set. We can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and we should be open to receive the, the gifts of the Spirit there, that should be made available to us and we should know that that is something that can happen and should happen with that provision. So Apollos being a man who was well taught up to the point where he knew what he knew, but in order for him to be able to fully expound the ways of God and the new covenant, he had to be more fully educated. So thank God there was an Achilla and a, and a Priscilla in his life who as a team were able to take him aside and teach him the ways of God more perfectly. And I'm sure that Apollos was not the only one that they discipled and they explained more fully the gospel of salvation, baptism, and the gifts of the Spirit that were made available to the New Testament church. So we see a wonderful pattern that is set, a husband and a wife, as we've talked about in past episodes, who worked beautifully as a team in ministry. They were able to be hospitable. They were able to educate and further teach those who needed to know the way of God more perfectly. And they were available to travel with Paul as he went from place to place on his missionary journey. So that's the beginning of a look at the time in Ephesus. Paul was also a tent maker, and he used that skill alongside Achilla and Priscilla as well. They were all tent makers. So we see that they have made, in the natural, they made tents, but in the spirit realm, they were tent makers or tabernacle builders, if you apply it spiritually, just like they built Apollos more sure and his foundation in the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we trust that this has been an encouragement and a blessing to you, and we will look more fully next time into where Paul was used and how he taught the people more perfectly about the way of salvation. So God bless you. and We send our love to you now. In Jesus' name. Yeah.
ourselves from these shores to spread the gospel. sons to take the kingdom to all the earth. May this covenant of dedication remain to all generations. As long as earth remains, we will be evangelists. scriptures may be fulfilled. All the ends of the world shall remember the Lord and worship before Him. For the kingdom is the Lord's and He is ruler of the nation.